Electricity is the flow of charge, or charges like electrons. They carry energy from a source of energy to a component. By the way, you're going to see me mix up cells and batteries in this video because they're just the same thing, really, and they do the same job. The battery has a store of chemical potential energy. When connected in a complete circuit, this energy is transferred to the electrons, which move through the wires. This movement of charge is called a current, and we say it always goes from the positive terminal of a battery to the negative. You might realize that that seems a little bit backwards, but that's just the way it has to be. It's convention. As the electrons pass through the bulb, their energy is converted into light. But the electrons don't just disappear once they transfer all the energy to the bulb. As this is one big loop, these electrons are pushed back round to the battery by the ones behind them, where they're refilled with energy, ready for another trip round the circuit. This constant flow of electrons transferring energy is what keeps the light bulb on. We don't deal with individual electrons, but instead deal in coulombs of electrons, or coulombs of charge. Potential difference, PD for short, also known as voltage, tells us how much energy is transferred per coulomb of electrons. So if a cell or battery says it's one volt, that means that it's one joule of energy given to every coulomb of electrons that pass through it. If a battery is six volts, that means six joules is supplied per coulomb instead. We measure PD with a voltmeter. They're always connected in parallel across the components you want to measure the voltage of, the PD of. In the real world, that means the leads or cables from the voltmeter always piggyback onto other leads. If we put the voltmeter across the battery, it should measure 6 volts, right? Because 6 volts is supplied to the electrons in the circuits, 6 joules per coulomb. But put it across the bulb, and it still says 6 volts. Why? Because the electrons have to lose all of that 6 volts worth of energy as they pass through. Here's the equation for PD. PD in volts is equal to energy in joules divided by charge in coulombs. In simple form, V equals E over Q. Q is the symbol for charge, but it's measured in C in coulombs. Current, on the other hand, tells us what the rate of flow of charge is. Like any equation for a rate, as per usual, it's something divided by time. So here it's current in amps equals charge in coulombs divided by time in seconds, or I equals Q over T. We measure current with an ammeter. Note that it's not amp meter. Unlike a voltmeter, it must go in series. This means in line. Components in a circuit have resistance, that is, they resist the flow of charge or current through them. But that's not a bad thing, this has to happen in order for them to work. A bulb has resistance, which causes energy to be transferred and light to be emitted. A resistor, of course, has resistance too, but it just produces heat when current flows through it. If you make a circuit with a resistor and change the PD available to it, what we find is that an increasing PD results in a greater current flowing. In fact, doubling one doubles the other, so we can say the PD and current, or V and I, are directly proportional. Drawing a graph of these two makes a straight line through the origin, and if we turn the battery round, we can get negative values for both two, but still a straight line. This straight line with a constant gradient shows that the resistor has constant resistance. We say it's ohmic. The steeper the gradients of this line, the lower the resistance of the resistor, as more current is flowing per volt. The equation for resistance is Ohm's law, V equals IR. We can get the resistance of a component from an IV graph like this by picking a point on the line and rearranging Ohm's law, so R is equal to V over I. For a resistor, you'll end up with the same answer no matter what point you pick. If you repeat the same experiment for a bulb in place of the resistor though, you'll end up with a curved graph like this instead. This shows that the resistance is changing, the resistance of the metal filament in the bulb. In fact, you'll find that any metal has a changing resistance if you increase the PD and current. They're non-ohmic. At higher PDs, the current increases less and less, so that means they can't be proportional. This shows that the resistance of the metal is increasing with higher PDs and higher currents. The change in gradient shows that this is true, but we still just take a point on the line and use Ohm's law if we want to find the resistance. It's just that it does matter where you pick the point in this case. Note that we never draw a tangent on a curved IV graph. The gradient doesn't give you anything. So why does resistance change for a metal? Well, it's because metals consist of a lattice or grid of ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. That just means that they're free and free to move, or rather, fairly free to move, as they do collide with the ions as they flow. That's why the metal heats up when you pass a current through it. The higher the current, the more frequent these collisions are, and this makes the ions vibrate more and more, which in turn makes it harder for the electrons to flow. The resistance has increased. The resistance has increased. Now, there is another component called a diode. It will give you this graph. The circuit symbol might give you a clue as to why this is. A diode only lets current flow in one direction. We say that in one direction, the resistance is very high and it's very low in the other, which is why the current suddenly increases at around one volt. An LED is a light emitting diode, similar symbol, just with a couple of extra bits showing that light is emitted. These are what most lights in electronics are these days rather than filament lamps. 
A superconductor is a material that can have a resistance of zero. Not nearly zero, actually zero. Generally, these materials need to be cooled before they reach this point, though, so you might see a graph like this. As the temperature goes down, so does the resistance, until boom, we hit what we call the critical temperature. Below this critical temperature, the resistance is zero. Every material has a different resistivity, or resistivity, some people say. The definition is this. It's the resistance of a cube of unit length sides of that material. So in SI units, that's the resistance in ohms of a one meter cube. Note that this is not resistance per meter cube. The definition must involve an actual cube. The unit we use is therefore ohm meters. Again, be careful, does not ohms per meter. To find resistivity, we measure the diameter of a wire with a micrometer and calculate area from that using pi d squared over four. We then measure V and I to calculate R for varying lengths of the wire measured with a meter rule. Plotting R against L gives a proportional relationship. The equation for resistivity therefore is this, R equals rho L over A, where rho is resistivity in ohm meters. Rearranging this, we have rho equals Ra over L. The gradient of the graph is R over L, so multiplying by this area gives us the resistivity. Here's the simplest series circuit we can make, just two resistors in line with the battery. What you need to remember is that for components in series, total PD is shared between them, current is the same for all of them, and the total resistance is just the sum of all the resistances. They're just added up. Let's deal with that first point. If these resistors are the same, let's say 10 ohms each, then that six volts total PD from the battery must be shared between them. So if we put a voltmeter across each of these, they both read three volts. It wouldn't matter what resistance these resistors are, they could be a million ohms each. If they're the same, then that total PD is shared equally. By the time the electrons leave the second resistor, they have to have lost all six volts worth of energy, ready to go back to the battery to be refueled. This idea is actually just Kirchhoff or Kirchhoff's second law. The sum of EMFs must equal the sum of PD drops in a closed loop. Just remember that if batteries are pointing in opposite directions, one of them must be a minus EMF. By the way, we can also call this setup a potential divider circuit as the total potential, total PD, is being shared. If the resistors don't have the same resistance, then we can use the second point to help us. That is, the current is the same for both. Let's say that the first resistor is 20 ohms using four volts of the total six volts available. We know two things out of V, I, and R. So let's use Ohm's law to find out what the third unknown thing is, current in this case. Rearranging Ohm's law, we get I is equal to V over R. So that's four divided by 20. 0.2 amps. Same for the second resistor too. But is there also a second thing we know about the other resistor? Why yes there is. Remembering the first rule up here, we know that if the first resistor is using 4 volts of the total 6 volts available, while well, the other resistor must be using 2 volts. We could then use Ohm's law again to find its resistance, 10 ohms. The rule of thumb is this, the greater the resistance, the greater the share of the total PD it gets. We can also use Ohm's law for a whole circuit. We just need to make sure we're dealing with the total PD, total current, and total resistance. The rules for parallel circuits are the opposite. The PD is the same for every branch. Again, this is true because of Kirchhoff's second law. The battery is actually involved in two loops, you see. So therefore, the PD drops in both loops must be the same. Current is shared between each branch, and the more resistors you add in parallel, the lower the total resistance. This, by the way, is because you're giving the current more routes to move through the circuit, which means more current can flow. So if these two resistors are connected to the six volt battery in parallel, you know straight away that the PD for both has to be six volts. Voltage is not shared in parallel circuits. If however, we say 0.5 amps total current is flowing through the battery and 0.2 amps of that is flowing through the top resistor, that means there must be 0.3 amps flowing through the bottom resistor. This is actually Kirchhoff's first law, total current into a junction equals total current out. If you're not in a rush, why not pause the video and see if you can calculate these two resistances. By the way, if you want a little bit more help on this, then have a look at my video, How to Answer Any Electricity Question. It's not only metals that can change resistance, we can have a thermistor and you can have a circuit that responds to changes in temperature. A thermistor's resistance decreases if the temperature increases. So in essence, it does the opposite to a metal. By the way, you might see it called an NTC thermistor, negative temperature coefficient. That just means the higher the temperature, the lower the resistance. In this case, if the resistance increased, the resistance of the thermistor would go down, as does its share of the total PD. That means the PD measured by this voltmeter here will increase. This could be the basis of a temperature sensor for your central heating, for example. An LDR is a light-dependent resistor, very similar to a thermistor, but resistance goes down with increased light intensity, not temperature. So this circuit could be on the top of a street lamp, for example. 
light intensity goes down, resistance of the LDR goes up, as does its share of the voltage. This could then be connected in some way to the light bulb, so it turns on as it gets dark. Power is the rate of energy transferred, so energy divided by time. However, when it comes to electricity, P equals VI. A battery or cell produces DC, direct current, the PD and therefore current only ever point in one direction. Electronics need DC to work, generally. However, AC, alternating current, is needed to transmit electricity over long distances, say through the national grid. This is because transformers are needed to step up the voltage, reducing the current before it enters the grid. The neutral wire in mains stays at a potential of zero volts, while the live wire varies between plus 325 volts and minus 325 volts. So we say the peak voltage is 325 volts, and we might say the peak to peak voltage is 650. However, to do any measurements with AC, we must convert it to a DC equivalent by using root mean square values. To convert from peak voltage to RMS voltage, or VRMS, the conversion factor is root 2. 325 divided by root 2 gives us 230 volts, which you probably know is what UK mains voltage is known to be. It's the RMS value we're given. And it also works for current too. To go from peak power to mean or average power, it's a little bit different. We don't call it RMS power, by the way. It's not quite the same. It turns out batteries and cells have a resistance of their own. So if you attach a bulb to a 6 volt battery, the bulb will get less than that. A voltmeter across it might measure 5.5 volts, say. This would also be the same if we attached the voltmeter across the battery terminals instead. So we can call this the terminal PD. Be careful, this means the voltage available to the circuit. That means 0.5 volts is being lost inside the battery due to its internal resistance, little r. The EMF, electromotive force, epsilon is the symbol we use, is the total PD provided. That's the 6 volts here. So the equation is this. EMF equals terminal PD, V, plus I, little r. So I times little r is the voltage lost due to the internal resistance. If we increase the load resistance, that's the resistance of the circuit, the current flowing through the battery decreases, of course but this results in less PD being lost in the battery. So the terminal PD increases. Drawing a graph of terminal PD against current gives us a straight line. The magnitude of this gradient is equal to the internal resistance. If we extrapolate the line back to the y-axis, the y-intercept is equal to the EMF, which makes sense as if there's no current flowing, then in theory, the circuit should get the whole of the EMF. There's no volts lost in the battery. You can, of course, get the EMF by just attaching a voltmeter across the battery by itself with nothing else connected. This works as voltmeters generally have very, very high resistance, so essentially no current is flowing. Semiconductors sit between insulators and conductors, you might have guessed. We can tell how well a material conducts electricity by comparing their number densities, that is, how many charge carriers there are per meter cubed. For conductors like metals, the number density is around 10 to the 28, semiconductors around 10 to the 17, give or take. Moving more electrons into the conduction band increases this number. Insulators, of course, have a very low number density. Drift velocity is what we call the literal speed of electrons as they flow through the wire in meters per second. There's not really much point in knowing this, but here we go. The equation is this. Current is equal to cross-sectional area times number density times charge of an electron times drift velocity. We can then rearrange this for V if needed. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And don't forget to check out our revision app to help you test your knowledge. And I'll see you next time.